Hey everyone. Good Monday morning for a little bit. Um, I am Jody O'Brien, everyone, and I am going to be your host for this session of Prepare for Impact, Managing a Crisis, Managing in a Time of Crisis or Change. And we have a really great program for you today. I don't know if anyone um, yeah, who was watching us on Friday did exactly what I did, but um, John um, Delcheski introduced the um, start of this um, five-part series. And he made mention that there was a special broker forum at NAR that was following this. And I had seen it in my email. So um, per John's advice, I jumped off of this um, program and onto that program. And there was a broker panel there. And a gentleman was talking about a number of items that we're gonna talk about today. and. My thought as it hit me was, and he was explaining what he had done last week. My thought was, should I have put this first? Should I have really talked about a lot of these things first? And then later on in the day, I was watching the update on the um, situation going on out in the world. And um, my new favorite person, um, Dr. Fauci, any, anybody else a fan? Raise your hand if you've become <laughs> I see everyone's hands going up. Um, I know, can we elect him president? Um, I just, I love the, his style and the way he was doing it. But someone asked him if it was um, too late for whatever measure he was talking about. It might've been the wearing the masks in public, et cetera. You know, and he said, it's really never too late till we have everything under control. And, and it made me kind of sigh and think, you're right, it's never, it's never too late. But there's a bigger lesson in here that I'd love everyone to walk away with. And that lesson is actually in the presentation itself. This is a version and I have updated it for everyone, but it's a version of a presentation that I was asked to give a group of managers in the company I was working for in 2008. Um, and as many of you know, in 2008, we were sliding into a down market in fact, it got so bad that the company I was working for actually um, closed. It sold off parts of it, but closed other parts of it. And as I always love to joke, my last duty there was shutting the lights off, right? Um, and I think, wow, I kind of put this away in the corner, let it grow dust and cobwebs and et cetera. And yet the real lessons here are, number one is I should be paying attention to these things on a regular basis and I should um, make sure I'm doing these things on a, on, um, on a somewhat scheduled basis and sort of last but not least that I have these tools when I need them and they're quickly accessible. So we're gonna take a look at um, sort of what I've, I've kind of named hunker down or double down. And these are the tools that we're going to look at in, and we're going to gather this information and this data and these reports, and we're going to decide whether, you know, whether we as an individual, a company, a, a large organization, or just an, um, um, you know, a single office or multiple office, no matter what your situation is, we're going to look at what things should we really stop doing. And what things should we continue doing and what things should we start doing from, from that perspective? So we're going to take a look at all of these things. Now, I, I want to first say to everyone here on, on the webinar today, I want to remind you actually of two things. Just a little housekeeping thing just to make sure everyone knows. Um, I had so many requests last time for the um, slide deck that I actually put it in the handout section. So right down here on the bottom of your screen should be your toolbar. It could be this way or this way, depending on how you're holding your device, everyone, or what device you're on. But you should see a toolbar to this platform and it should say, um, you saw your hands, a lot of you raised your hands, thank you for doing that. You should see the question mark, which allows you to ask a question to me or chat over a feature to me. 
and you should see what looks like a sort of sheaths of paper. And that's the handout section. If you click on that, I put the slide deck in a PDF format so everyone can download it. Um, it was a little larger than I expected, so I think it has some embedded fonts in it. So um, I would suggest you do that now. Don't wait till the last minute um, so that you make sure you get the handout and so you have that information. Um, Again, please feel free. We are recording this and I will be doing something, as I mentioned last time, that's a little unusual. I'll be answering your question without kind of making acknowledgements so everyone feels free to ask their questions without um, sort of interpretation and, um, you know, um, competition and all of those things that may go forward in not only this webinar, but the recording of this webinar. So um, please feel free. This should be everybody's safe place to come and ask questions and see what we have and get not only my feedback, but the feedback of all of you that are on this group as well. All right. And then last but not least, I want to say, you know, I'm going to make some suggestions. First of all, the most important thing is the analyzation of this information, you know, that we take those actions. And those things I'm going to say, I think, are really important for everyone on our program today. But whether you decide to hunker down or double down is really up to you. I don't have your data that I'm putting into this program. So I'm gonna make some general recommendations, but those recommendations may not apply to you. Hopefully what you walk away with here is how to get the information and then how to make that decision, which is actually why I'm glad I went back and um, I did the first thing first, the five truths, how you make these. Remember we called them how you, you have to make choices and some of them will be hard choices. So. If you did not join us Friday for that session, it has been recorded. I did not get a confirmation, but it should be, if it is not already, it should be up on um, Greater Boston's Association of Realtors YouTube station. Um, I'm hoping to get a link for that um, at some time um, in the near future. So if you can't find it, shoot me an email and hopefully I'll have the link by then to make sure you know how to go through this process of making these decisions, how you want to proceed. Do you want to hunker down or do you want to double down on some of this information? So I had two quotes, everyone, and actually let me just slide this out of my way, all right? Um, and I thought this one was really interesting, particularly since just before this all started, I um, was, the last thing I did was a convention in Nashville right before all of this started, which I'm not sure if they're the home of um, Morgan & Morgan, the law firm, or they're just very prominent in that market, but they were literally all over the place. But this is from John Morgan of Morgan & Morgan. Most of you are familiar with the, you know, his television commercials. Playing a good defense means running the law firm like a business being conservative in your spending and worrying about tomorrow much more than today. I think that's such great advice, everyone. I think we should all be thinking about that as a real estate company, right? How we should be looking at those things. And frankly, I think we'd all agree <laughs> that Morgan & Morgan is a successful law firm and has been for a number of years. But if we were looking on the double downside, here's another very successful individual, Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York and presidential candidate and multi-billionaire, whatever he is. And he says, being an entrepreneur isn't really about starting a business. In a way, it's looking at the world, seeing opportunities where others see obstacles, taking risk when others take refuge. Boy, does that last line, taking risk where others take refuge, particularly ring true to this um, environment we're in right now. So, and, and you know what I think, frankly, I think the truth for almost all of us is really somewhere in the middle. And I'm actually going to quote another um, person who many of you know, I am a huge fan of, um, I may have almost embarrassed myself at a former 
um, road show when I was fortunate enough to meet this person, but I'm a big fan of Barbara Corcoran and have been for a number of years. And um, one of Barbara's pieces of advice that she continues to give, by the way, she's a wonderful podcast, everyone, if you're not listening to it. It's a great podcast where people call in, write in, or or that about information. And so she takes just these little snippets of, of her wisdom and gives them to people. And one of the things she is just really known for, she consistently says, is, you know, that you need a sort of an opposite perspective in your business. And she talks about um, hiring the person, um, and I apologize, I've forgotten her name, um, uh, her longest time employee and saying, that when she opened up her card, there were all file folders in, I mean, opened up her purse, there were all file folders in her purse with everything kind of organized um, from that. And she took um, Barbara's card, who was about to thank her very much and dismiss her without consideration of hiring her. And when Barbara saw her put the card in a slot, in a file, she realized that she had organizational skills that Barbara was clearly missing. And they may have made great partners ever since. So I think that's true somewhere here between John Morgan and Michael Bloomberg. The answer for you is not one or the other. It's somewhere in between, everyone. It's a unique mix or blend how you're going to go forward. And let me share with you, we don't really have anybody with with a um, who has set this path before us. Sure, we've had some hard times in real estate and we've had some good times and we've had opportunities and we've had loss, but I really think this is a very new situation. So this is a path that you truly are going to be blazing for yourself and by yourself. Um, and that I think is significant um, to understand. Remember everybody, we said there's no blame last week. We talked about taking responsibility, which is not equal to blame. So let's take a responsibility and let's take a very responsible look at expenses. Yeah. What are your finances right now, everyone? And the very most important thing I think you need to understand that you have true control over are your expenses. Now I want you to take a whole look at your finances. So get out your CFO, get out your money person, get to your accountant, whatever you need to do. But I think you need to sit down and take a really careful look at your finances, all right? A really magnifying glass scrutiny of your financing. FYI, I think this is an important skill to be teaching agents as well out there is truly looking at what their finances are. I just threw up on these charts some of these things, salaries and rents and um, vendors that are out there, insurance, supplies, dues, subscriptions, marketing material, equipment. I mean, obviously the list would be too long to even get on the screen. I want you to write down every single expense that you have going. And here's a couple of don't forgets. Don't forget your automatic withdrawals, your automatic charges, and your automatic renewals. And no amount of money is too small because those little $5, $50, $100, one-offs that didn't seem like a lot of money in a really good market may add up to a huge amount of expenses that are things you're not even paying attention to. By the way, um, hopefully you do something and something I've always advised to people um, that they have a that they have separate business accounts, separate credit card, business credit cards, et cetera. That said, I don't know about all of you, but every once in a while, Stuff sneaks onto my personal cards and my personal bank account. Why? I don't know. It's probably just more convenient or it was a default on something as I clicked on the button. And every once in a while I go through, I put things on the wrong card. And that's important, everyone, because if you're not paying attention, you're not necessarily accounting for that kind of automatic aspect. 
By the way, every vendor, every service you have that is on automatic renewal, mark the date because that's going to be significant whether you want to continue. So I have a question for you. I actually have two questions. I'm going to ask you both questions before we go back and take a look at it because I'd like to get kind of your pulse and see um, what's happening in the marketplace out there. So um, here's my first question to you. What do you think is your largest expense? Right? Right now, is your rent the largest expense? Is your um, salaries and benefits the largest expense? Is it marketing, insurance, or others? Um, by the way, just an FYI, no one can see your, we're just gonna see a tally. No one can see what you're voting, so, um, so that you know that. Oh, well, Paul, thank you very much. I'm gonna, um, copy that and send it to everyone from the chat message, everyone. So um, thank you to, well, I don't know why it doesn't want to go out to everyone. Paul gave us the YouTube channel. So while you guys are all finishing up your vote, I'm going to send it out through the chat message to all of you. Paul, thank you very much for doing that. I appreciate it. And everyone should see their chat bubble pop up or their question mark pop up. And that's the YouTube station for you um, to take a look at. So I appreciate that. All right. Let's see. Now remember, before I show you everyone's results, I'm gonna ask you the second question, because we're gonna take a lot. What is your, not anybody else's, not anyone else's opinion, but what is your most important expense? What are you gonna rank as, now if I were to, told you to take all your expenses and rank them in an order of importance, not amount, but importance, what would it be? What will it be? What do you think is your most important? I know this one's harder, isn't it? <laughs> Tony, I thought I'd be able to take some time to think about these and analyze these. We're just trying to see what your sort of temperature is, uh, taking a guess. Don't forget everyone, when you make your selection to hit submit, then your poll should go away for the moment till I close it out and give everyone. Right. All right. So let's take a look, everybody. Here's what you all said was your largest expense. Ooh, and I'm actually kind of surprised that we don't really have a winner, so to speak. All right. Um, so um, I kind of have it evenly distributed amongst the top four selections, rent, salaries and benefits, marketing, insurance. Then I have some others that we gave. Um, if anyone wants to throw up the others in the chat feature, feel free to do all those things. But those are some of the important things. I'm curious then, so let's take a look at... How you rank them in order of importance. Ah, very interesting. All right. So a quarter of you on today's um, webinar said your rent was your largest expense. Yet no one ranked it the most important. No one ranked it the most important. Even those who just said it wasn't, um, it wasn't, large no no one ranked it important that's going to be an interesting point as we start to make decisions and choices now um marketing and insurance insurance kind of makes sense everyone because the fact of the matter is it's for some of us it's required it's certainly recommended for everyone that's out there um so for example 
errors and omission insurance is something that it, it may be required of you by state law. If you're an LLC, you know that you're required to carry errors and omission. That said, I'd kind of imagine a real estate um, company operating without um, errors and omission insurance. We have all sorts of other business insurance, et cetera, um, that goes on. That said, are we really analyzing? and looking at that. Some of you are saying this is really important. In fact, more of you voted it was important than voted it was your largest expense. And our marketing effort got a higher amount than those who said it was um, a large expense. So it's really interesting to see how we kind of looked at some of those things. Where do I want you to go with those things? Well, the very first thing before you decide whether you're gonna hunker down or double down on any of those things is I think you have to prioritize your expenses. And number one, is it important, all right? Is it aligned with your values that you, um, your mission statement, your vision statement? Does it have a future? I think that the answer to that one, and maybe the first question, may have been something that many of you have actually already started to figure out. And this is something that's really unique to this um, environment we're in, but it's bringing out a point that frankly has been being talked about since, I don't know, the early 2000s, maybe even a little before that, but certainly by the 2000s. And that is, the bricks and mortar of our of our industry, all right? Um, do we need it? Do we need the largest, most expensive retail space that, that um, exists? I consistently hear managers asking, right, if, how, how do I get people back in the office, Jody? I walk in, I'm there all day, and if one person comes in, that's unusual. The answer, I, the answer isn't isn't the answer, it's the question is the problem, everyone. How do you get people back in? You may not get people back in because frankly, why do you have the space that they're not in or not utilizing um, at all anyway? And that may be something that many of you have just figured out, all right? That your um, rent is not important and it does not have a future. And again, please remember, but I'm not talking for everyone here because this may not be something that is applicable for you. But it is certainly a topic of conversation that's been going on in the industry for quite a while. And wow, hasn't this highlighted it? Hasn't everyone stepped up to the plate to be running virtual office meetings and virtual connections and helping their agents you know, use virtual platforms um, such as transaction management and forms platforms and et cetera. Haven't we all stepped up to the plate and realized that business can be conducted, albeit at a much lower level where most of us are conducting business, we are still conducting business. We are still closing on all the properties that were under agreement. You know, we're moving forward with that. We're still seeing new listings every day. We're still seeing under agreements every day. Again, clearly lessened, but we're out there and we're doing business. Is my bricks and mortar necessary? Is that is that expense necessary, right? Do you need it now? That's almost two different questions. Do you need it and do you need it now, right? Because Frankly, there's a lot of things that we have thought we needed that clearly we have not needed. Think of all the things that maybe are locked in your office, right? Is your office, your bricks and mortar still remains in shutdown capacity under the um, regulations of essential businesses. Think of all those things that are in that bricks and mortar that you are not using, yet you are conducting some business. So clearly don't need those things right now what will be the what will be the now of the future will there ever be a now again what are what are those tools that you have that you may not need is that expense something that will help you move forward and i was so thrilled to see marketing really not only be a good uh, a, a um, high priority expense but something that's really important to you 
Because frankly, I think those are some of the things that we'll look at to move us forward. How how are we going to look at all of all of this information and how are we going to continue to do business to sort of keep the lights on? Is it necessary? Right? So insurance, everyone, we all had to put that down there because for the most part, it's necessary, it's required by law. And there are other aspects that will be required by law. So whether I no longer keep paper file folders in a file cabinet in an office space on Main Street USA, by law, I still need those documentation. So I have to look for online transaction management programs. All right. So is that expense necessary? What do I do with all of that um, information is what do I give up? Right? How will I how how will I give up? So here's what you need to do. I think you need to hunker down with the with financing. And by the way, everyone, I know that we're prompted in essence by I hate using that word crisis, but we're kind of, crisis is an immediate, intense moment, but we're going to need it in the future, I believe, because of this. And frankly, good market, bad market, and different market, I think we should be doing this exercise on a regular basis. This should be something that you literally look at on a regular basis. Number one, everyone, is we're going to look at what you can eliminate, right? You got to get that red pen out and you got to start slashing and burning those expenses. All right. You got to get them down. You need to look at what you do need, what is necessary, all right, or what is important. And you need to look at can you reduce it or renegotiate it? You should be on the phone with every vendor that you have decided to keep and that you find is important or necessary, and you should be looking to renegotiate that, including landlords, which is a weird thing for us because we're also the landlords and we um, represent landlords, but you know what? Only the strong survive, only those people that understand, you know, that you, we need to all be in this together and start looking at it. So. Where can everyone else kind of help out and what can you do to renegotiate any of the expenses you have? And, you know, one of the things I say all the time when I'm teaching our real estate negotiation expert is, is everything is negotiable. A skill that, interestingly enough, even those of us who negotiate on a regular basis don't think so. So I don't care what it is, everyone. I don't care what kind of vendor it is. Just get, pick up that and if it is ranked in that important or necessary and I need to keep it, then see if you can negotiate the cost of it. Look to see if something that you're not using now but you think will be necessary. So you guys all ranked marketing really high. But marketing, for example, actual physical materials, paper is something maybe no one's using at the moment and no one needs. Maybe you have enough of it. Um, to get you by a little bit. So maybe you want to suspend um, some of those services that print marketing material until you need it again, right? So look and see again what you truly um, need, but you don't need it now. And look to see if you can suspend the um, expense for the moment. Now remember, and don't forget, and again, here was something, here was the main reason why I jumped on this, um, that call last week, everyone, um, which was recorded. So I think it's up there. Um, this is in your handout. So you can copy it now, everyone, or take a screenshot of it right now, or jump over to your web browser um, and um, copy it down. Um, this is um, a, a particular page within NAR's um, COVID-19 page and all that information of that. And this is the explanation and the tools needed to the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. I know, do people like stay awake at night to think how long of a name they can give these things? Um, I'm just probably gonna, if I refer to it now in the future, just gonna call it the Relief Act right? It's so what I've decided to shorten it down to. Um, you may, you also can find this, everyone, through the right tools right now 
um, link. So if you go on nar.realtor slash right tools right now, you know that Bob Goldberg put that up last week and all the um, team and staff and, um, at NAR. It was a page that actually we had up in the 2008 market, all the things that were necessary that you could use that were free or of lowered cost to you in brokerage and agents that are out there. So um, keep that in mind, everyone, because frankly, there could be opportunities in these um, loans that are potentially out there. But one of the aspects of the loan is there's actually salary relief. So for those of you who are spending a significant amount on staff salary, that's important to you. It's within your mission statement to protect um, your the personnel, the people in your company. Then reach out and see if this makes sense to take this to take a loan to cover that so that you can keep the doors open using some of the money for some other things. So um, make sure you look at that. Next, here's an exercise again, I think everyone should be looking at, um, is what their agent population is in their um, company. And by the way, I think that many of these things are, are great for agents to look at as well. And we'll, we'll go into them a little deeper. This is actually, a synopsis of, of a topic that I talk a lot about in some other programs, um, quartiling your agents. And I realize, you know, anytime I try to put um, people into big boxes, they don't always fit. So these are real general um, bullet points to each quartile. But this, but your agents are quartiled or divided into four by production. And your first quartile is your highest producers. Now, here's some other aspects to your first quartile. They are often on your highest split, all right? They are often taking the most amount of the commission for themselves and leaving the smallest amount. Most high producers, top quartile people are extremely independent. They are often the people that you find hard to get into office meetings, hard to attach to the office, et cetera. And by the way, you may have also made concessions to this group. In other words, um, you may be paying for things that you are charging for other agents. You may provide be providing them from other services at your cost, et cetera. I think it's important for you to look at and analyze all of that information. Your second tier is your second quartile. They're really good producers. They tend to be on your moderate splits um, from that. They're also fairly independent, but they're a little bit more team um, players for the most part. And um, this one, this um, team, this group usually does not have a lot of concessions to it. Your third quartile is your moderate producers or newer agents, probably agents in the business, probably um, one to three or five years um, will usually end up in your moderate quartile. They're all again on your moderate splits, by the way. They used to be on your average splits. Now you've got you've got everybody up higher and higher um, through this process as many of you were out competing and moving in this retention and um, recruitment phase from that. Your third quartiles really are agents that need coaching or mentoring to move them up to your second quartile. In your fourth quartile, actually your bottom tier are made up by two different groups and it's important to recognize those things because some decisions you might make may change from that. Your fourth quartile, group number one, or 4A, shall we call them, is your low producers. As a matter of fact, I might go as far as to say you're no producers, right? And they are also 4B is your new agents, agents in the marketplace less than one year, all right? Again, everyone, these should have been on the lowest of low splits. That's typically how we ran. I am finding more and more of you are have your fourth quartile agents on more moderate splits. That may be something that I think will be coming to an end or needs to come to an end. Your fourth quartile agents, particularly for A, your um, low producers are often needy. And your four Bs, the newer agents need a lot of coaching or mentoring. 
in the tools. So what's important for us, why we wanna go down and look at that everyone is because here's a place we wanna hunker down because here's the first thing I wanna say. Every agent has a cost associated with them. Every agent. And I'm gonna share something everyone that a um, client of mine shared discovered as we were doing this exercise um, that they were absolutely astounded at, right? And here it goes back to those expenses and those um, potentially small amounts of money, all right? But on, on this um, client's roster, he had some no producers down in his, four, in his fourth quarter, not many, um, but a couple of people who were basically almost retired or, you know, had never really produced much, but they were still on his roster, right? And um, his perspective was initially, they don't cost me anything. And I said, that, that isn't true. Every agent costs you something. And one of the things we discovered his cost was that his email system that he had, right, was tiered by users. And he was in a tier by only a few number of email addresses that was significantly higher in cost than the tier below him. So when he eliminated those people that were on the roster that had an email account associated with his office, he was able to drop his tier down in his email user and literally save himself hundreds of dollars. Now, hundreds of dollars doesn't seem like a lot of money, but do that over and over again. That's a significant amount of money. I don't know what the number is right now. I'm not sure anybody's actually surveyed it, probably because we've been in such a good market for so long. But the number that has floated around in the past is that every agent costs you approximately $18,000 in goods and services to maintain on your roster. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot more money. That's a lot more money. So I think we need to look to look at those things. And, and FYI, if that agent needs to make a living and they're not making it in real estate, can I just say we're not doing anybody a favor by keeping them in our office and on our roster. So first evaluate and quartile your agents. Then sit down and review everything and review it with them. All right, because you'd be surprised. Some of your third and fourth quartile agents will actually rise to this occasion. This will be the thing that motivates them to have their best year ever, right? But it's amazing how much you need to analyze and look at a lot of this information and offer your assistance that you can utilize. I think the other thing is everyone, you need to look closely at your compensation packages, right? Um, so I know that many of you have taken the um, compensation CRB class with me. If you haven't everyone taken, here's a great opportunity. These classes are all online and um, you can go find them at the Real Estate Business Institute, REBI. Real Estate, REBinstitute.com. Say that again, say that again hard, right? Um, rebinstitute.com and uh, you can find there's a number I think we're up to um, 11 11 or 12 um, courses certified residential brokerage classes that um, are open to everyone office managers team leaders broker owners or just agents who want to be in those roles in the future and the compensation one is really something I think are real skills and we can sharpen to and we can look at. Now, obviously, again, these are gonna be things that we're gonna to have to take a look at and we're gonna to have to mix them with sort of the next topic coming up, which is recruitment or retention. So you remember this topic came up last week on Friday and um, one of you actually came in and um, raised this issue about um, companies recruiting um, to you. So the first thing here I'm going to say is, remember from last week, take responsibility, stop blaming others, all right? 
So where you stand on this position is not whether someone else is trying to recruit out of you, not recruit, use this decision, not that decision, everyone. The question is, what's the best for you, your company, your agents, your important list, that expenses that we took a look at, right? So number one, we're going to take re we're going to take responsibility for this. Number two, please remember that you, everyone on this webinar, everyone listening to this webinar in the future, and every broker owner across America is going to make different decisions. And we have to respect those decisions when they fall within the law and the ethics of our practices. So we may not like it that some companies are going to not only continue, but to ramp up recruitment. But if you are recruiting, then I say don't quit now. Because that, everyone, is a giant step backwards. If you have been out telling agents that you care, that you're the best, that you should come work over at us, and now you stop, that has a tremendous impact on people. That means we don't want you. We're in trouble. We're not the best, et cetera. If your business model has been in recruitment, recruitment ends up as an important to you. It's something that you feel that you want to continue doing then recruitment is what you should be doing. That said, please remember, who am I recruiting? Where do they fall in my quartile? What expenses are they going to add to my business? What income are they potentially going to produce? How should I, you know, how should I reach out to them? What should I say, right? Keep things above board, everyone. Tell them what you do not what they're not getting, right? And that's just a basic sales skill, everyone, is talk about yourself, your company, your platforms, your methods, and don't bash anyone else, right? It's not good practice. It's certainly not good ethics either. The second thing up, which I think everyone should be focusing on, is retention, right? Because it's not only retention from recruitment in the opposite perspective of recruitment, it's retention onto people who met, just might be thinking about giving up. So you could have someone that you've tiered into your third, second or third quartile that just isn't ready to go through a down market, that just isn't ready to work that hard, that just isn't believing that they can continue to do it and they need engagement right engagement is key i said this last week i said it um we said it in our group call when we were talking when we were showing you how to use virtual office meetings which um again um is so important um there we said you should be communicating often to your agents and everyone, here's something that I'm hearing out there now, is you should be gathering agents twice a week. That may look like two office meetings. It may look like one office meeting and then a series of groups that you niche them down. Maybe you, maybe you break down those people that need coaching and mentoring and have a contact or a meeting with them. You know, maybe it's an office meeting and a social meeting. So you've certainly seen everybody having virtual cocktail parties and scavenger hunts and all sorts of things going on. Come on, have some fun. Keep your agents engaged and keep retention. I want you, I want to help you. I'm here to help you. And again, we have some great tools on on um, right tools right now and the and links to the um, financial wellness center that was started in about oh, just about six months, six to eight months ago started the Financial Wellness Center. And there's some wonderful tools that you could be sitting there on virtual calls with an agent and reviewing their financing and their aspect. Those are key opportunities that you really wanna take a look at. So I think you should be doubling down on these activities with agents and communication. Again, often, often, often. Engagement, get them interacting with you. Make sure that they're calling you. By the way, everyone, you should be monitoring some of the Facebook groups and make sure your agents aren't out asking a Facebook group information. They should be contacting you. 
You should be reminding everyone on a regular basis. Here's how you get me. Call me, text me, email me, message me, Zoom me, whatever your interaction with them is. Care about them, right? You know, I know how it feels, everyone. I've been rushing to um, give all my clients um, attention and the and the information, the coursework, the coaching, everything they needed. And sometimes I have to take a breath and realize I forgot to ask how you were, right? I forgot to ask how your spouse or how you're dealing with kids and homeschooling and, you know, in make sure they know you care, right? Make sure they know you care. Make sure you care. Make sure you are helping. Give them information they need. Make sure you're communicating with them. What's your market area conditions? What are your market area? You know, is your registry filing? Is your do you have a notary? Do you? Have, I mean, what are the conditions in your local market? You're primarily responsible for that and getting that out there. Give them the resources they need. Provide them with the service. One of the things you should be doing, everyone, is inviting some of these vendors on your virtual meetings so that they know where's mortgage, where's home inspections, where is this information, what is the service that is there. And then I think last but not least, you need to be able to offer assistance to your agents. You know, once you've figured out your way through the Small Business Administrative Loans, are they going to be able to find? Do they, will they need or qualify for unemployment um, as we move forward? You need to know these resources so that you can truly understand them. Hang on, I have, see some questions in the queue. And by the way, feel free, everyone. Oh, there we go. I lost my mouse there for a minute. Ah, uh, so um, is there is there really a difference um, between um, some of these aspects with um, independent contractors and um, and um, salaries um, in employee situations? Well, first of all, please remember, everyone, because the majority of you practice with agents as independent contractors, not everyone does. So in some cases, although it is few. We're talking about um, we're talking about agents, all right. But for the most part, when we're talking about salary positions, we're talking about administrative assistants, um, tiered. Some of you are in larger companies where you're dealing with um, like regional vice presidents and, and those types of tiered activities as well um, that go through there. Um, marketing coordinators. Um, you know, relocation directors, I'm trying to think of who else, as I walk around, um, who else has salaried position. So we know right now, everyone, that we have some different concepts to salaried positions. So we have obviously um, laying off and furloughing, which makes some differences. Please, before you go through that, you might want to check with, if you don't, have a HR human resources department. We have there's lots of third party vendors out there that can help you through this, so you understand what some of the differences are with salaried, um, you know, people for employees. On independent contractor statuses, um, although they, I don't have an over, I don't have a specific um, amount of money I'm paying them on a weekly basis on a salary. As I said, independent contractor situations do. Um, create and do create an opportunity or an environment where I have some expenses um, going through. I don't know why that bubble keeps jumping up on me. Um, so there is, there are some differences, um, and then there's some likenesses between um, salaried employees and independent contractor situations. From that, also everyone, don't forget that um, what you all have available to you is. Um, although they're not human resources experts, they often deal with questions that relate to the legality of human resources issues. So you have both the hotlines at MAR and the hotline at Greater Boston. Um, and although they may not have the answer, they have a huge amount of resources that have the answers to that, as well as your own um, company or 
um, you know, office attorney as well can answer some of those questions. So great, great question from there. All right. So here's one that um, many of you identify as a significant or important issue that you wanted to kind of take a look at, and that was um, marketing. And here's, um, here's what I want you to look at first. First, I want you to identify and evaluate your market. I might even actually say define. You know, because when I ask agents in my classroom what's their market, well, let me give you my perspective first. When I was an agent out selling, many of you know that I come from north of Boston um, in Andover, and I sold in that marketplace as an agent for, for a number of years. And when I started selling, our local board of realtors and our MLS was the Greater Lawrence, so the Greater Lawrence Board of Realtors, and it covered two towns, Andover and North Andover, and two cities, Lawrence and Methuen. And the fact of the matter is that was not your marketplace, although it defined it because of the MLS um, information. You really were even more defined than that. You were what I like to call a town agent or a city agent. So you either sold in Andover or North Andover or you sold in Lawrence or Methuen. And frankly, it was even narrower than that because you were either an Andover broker agent or you were a North Andover broker and agent. You know, it kind of crossed over. And I always thought it was funny that um, I had access to information selling in Andover to Lawrence, yet, frankly, Reading and North Reading were far more like Andover than Lawrence or Methuen, but they were a different board of realtors. So, I understand that my focus was extremely narrow and that folk, you could not survive. Your agents could not survive. You couldn't survive your company by maintaining a business strictly focused in a single town for the most part. Some of you, some again, some of you niche and um, can figure those things out. But the same token, when an agent tells me their market is within the 495 belt, wow. All right, um, I think that's a really broad market area. So what's your definition of what your market area is, right? How do you identify it? What's the data involved in, in that market area? Days on the market, list to sell price ratio, you know all those numbers that we've been, again, harping on you to um, keep track of. And then what are some of the specifics? What's the range of property? What's the size of property? What's the buyer pool look like? You know, who is moving in and out of that? So describe all of those items. Identify your past performance. Did my company do better in a single market area or town than other market areas from that? Um, stop, see if that works. Uh, how how has my how has my um, office um, performed in the first time buyer market or the high end marketplace, et cetera? And what have been what are opportunities that I see in that market? So we talked about last week, for example, or I actually think I talked about it on the agent um, side of this series was the opportunities that were would probably come back in place in the investment venue, right? Um, which we have seen in every downturn market that I've ever been into, is we have seen, and we often you now use the term flippers. I'm going to use the term more broad than that as investors. So what do you see as the opportunity that's coming along in, in that perspective? And should you hunker down on things that are your market area? The size matters, everybody. Again, what kind of expenses is it costing you to market to this larger area? What kind of expenses is it costing you to have tools and techniques to go out to some of these broader market areas? Those things are significant and they're important to you. Is quality better than quantity? Because does quality kind of produce more in the long run? Again, remember, I'm trying to look down to the future as well. If I create a highly satisfied consumer, we know the studies have shown us over and over and over again, they are likely to refer more business to us 
than someone who thinks we did an okay job and certainly more than someone who thinks we did a bad job, all right? So is the quality of my service, my market conditions, really more important than others? And then, you know, we've been saying this always, and I think it is so important. The riches are in the niches, right? If we can narrow our focus down, we can actually be more and more successful, right? And just an FYI, I was reading before I jumped on this on um, one of my newsletters that, um, that I get, I was reading a um, interview of um, the founder of, um, of one of the subscription box services who said that she had neither experience in the um, actual subscription product itself or in the technology involved in subscription services, but she thought there was a need for it. And she went out and researched it, did her material and has developed a extremely successful subscription-based service. That means everyone, if you've identified a need, you don't need to already be the expert in providing it. Your agents don't need to be the expert in providing it. You can launch the service to provide that particular market segment, that particular niche, a real environment. And I hate to mention this one. Excuse me, let me just look up and tell them, please ignore me. <laughs> but we all know that in the 80s and again in the 2000s, we discovered the niche, many of us for the first time ever, in short sales and foreclosures, right? It's a perfect example of that. And you know, many of the people that were specializing in short sales and foreclosures in the 80s were no longer in the business in 2008, and we created an entirely new marketplace. So we all know that there are some people that really not only substantially rode out the wave by creating that niche, they actually became extremely successful by creating that niche. Again, don't listen to me. <laughs> I know I hesitate to mention that particular niche as, as you go through. Or should you double down on some of these opportunities? Should you look at low cost and no cost marketing? Hey, we probably have a few more weeks as we're sitting here conducting our business in, the, in um, our environment. Is it time to get on things like social media and get out there marketing to, um, to learn platforms like MailChimp and Constant Contact and that marketing programs? that are free or are extremely low cost um, for us? Should we be developing new marketing material? Again, um, out there on social media that comes in, should we be looking at key strategies to not only make sure we're observing within our companies, but we're teaching our agents, and that is pricing. Everyone, our Tuesday session for the agents is pricing strategies. Jump on it yourself. Learn what you can teach your agents. Get your agents to jump on it. Um, the, again, um, gbar.org, um, right on the main page is the um, Road to Success um, series, the agent series on it. We're going to be talking about pricing strategies. Pricing, I think, is going to be key. Contacting your sphere of influence, teaching your agents to contact your sphere of influence, um, going through those. Um, that process, and I'm going to tell you something that I have been talking about for 15 years in the classroom. I teach it to agents. I tell brokers they should be looking at it. Please don't forget your orphans. What the heck does she mean by that? You have past clients who, by the way, can remember your company name longer than they can remember their agent who sold them the property whose agent is no longer either A, in your office or B, in the industry, go through your records, pull them out. If you don't want to contact yourself, distribute them to your agents. Again, decide which quartile you want to give them to and make sure that your orphans are being communicated with. What does all this mean? The successful person makes a habit of doing what the failing person doesn't like to do. So, nobody wants to be in a position where they're reviewing these things that we just talked about. 
but to be successful, to hang on to the, our business in the upcoming months or maybe years, everyone, these things are important. And these things developed into habits, making them a habit will not only guarantee your success now, but will guarantee your continued success in the future. I hope that everyone got some ideas, some information. If you haven't already, click on that link down below and download your, the, um, this presentation so you have it to go through. I hope that you enjoyed this enough that you'll join us on for Friday's presentation. If you will also share it with others to join us on Friday. Everyone, please stay safe. See you all on Friday, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us.